devastating rains in British Columbia. We will see in the coming decades atmospheric rivers that are double, triple what we just saw. And that's that's terrifying to think about. Planetary waves cause cold ripples across the UK. Although we're confident we're going to have a colder than normal spell with this air, it has to come pretty direct to bring a risk of snowfall all the way down to sea level. And climate change in the world of Minecraft. The two worlds released so far tackle the subjects of agriculture and deforestation. It's Friday the 19th of November and you're listening to Weather Snap from the Met Office. Hello, I'm Claire Nazir and this is Weather Snap, an insider's guide to the week's weather headlines. Canada has experienced unprecedented rainfall this week as an event known as an atmospheric river brought torrential and persistent downpours to western regions. Storms have devastated agriculture, caused landslides, the evacuation of whole towns and sadly fatalities. Armel Castellan is a meteorologist based in British Columbia. Here he describes some of the impacts the state has endured in recent days. Armel, you saw this coming, didn't you? A river of rain just pushing up from the tropics. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we actually deal with atmospheric rivers almost all year long, particularly in the wet season. But, you know, every once in a while, an atmospheric river is a lot more potent. And it really, it does come from the subtropics. So it taps into that moisture that's associated to the extremely high ocean temperatures in and around Hawaii. Sometimes they get dubbed a pineapple express or a tropical pine. They're a long filament of extremely high moisture and temperatures and they eventually hit a part of the coast and the worst case scenarios like we saw last weekend is when they stall and they don't move on that coast so um, in this case it was a potent atmospheric river and there were several antecedent conditions that were at play one is that we've had an extremely wet and active fall so far so from mid-september we've had a parade of storms not all atmospheric rivers, but five of them. And we've had three, what they call weather bombs or bomb cyclones, meaning really low pressures, giving us extreme winds. The other piece is that we've had a lot of snow at mid elevations for the last 10 days. So we've gotten you know, some places above a meter of snow over the, the last few weeks. But this atmospheric river brings the freezing levels up to 3,000, 4,000 meters and it brings a lot of rain. So if it had happened uh, later in the winter when the snowpack is that much deeper, it can absorb pretty much anything. And you have to wait until the snow is isothermal, meaning all the same temperature before it melts out in the spring. Looking a little bit deeper into the interior, well, that's where we had wildfires this past summer, and that changes the landscape. Even the drought signal alone without fires makes the soil more hydrophobic. Which area of British Columbia has been most impacted by this storm? This is particularly on the south coast and the western part of what we call the southwest interior, so inland from the south coast. We have our big highway systems through there. The Coquihalla is the number five. The Highway 1, which is the Trans-Canada that goes up the Fraser Canyon, all affected with landslides, so road closures, people caught between landslides, Tragically, one woman died in a landslide. So we're talking about horrific impacts, uh, you know, hard to put into words. You know, uh, the, the, the agricultural sector, all of the animals that are perishing, you know, we're talking about 1.9 million poultry, and that's the first estimate. They're talking about probably more. All of the cows and the, the ranch lands are also affected. Transportation, there's people's health. I mean, Merritt alone had this entire town evacuated, about seven or 8,000 people, with the sewer being impacted. So a uh, very toxic kind of soup, and, and the recovery process from that is, is very long and painful. Uh, so just, yeah. Um, and what is unbelievable is to know that climate projections aren't just for heat events. So yes, we talked about the heat dome in late June and how that one is quickly attributable to climate change, had its fingerprint all over it. Things like rain events are a little bit more of an academic process in order to get to that attribution. That said, we know that the projections lean towards 
these type of events and actually worse. So it really could have been worse. And that's what we need to adapt to in the coming years and decades, because um, there's a scale to describe atmospheric rivers. It's used in the States. I don't know how Europe is doing so far, but we are definitely getting on board with naming what we're anticipating in a forecast and also naming what has transpired. So this looked like a atmospheric river level three of five. It probably is a four when it's all said and done. In fact, that scale isn't limited to one to five. It actually might go to eight. And we will see in the coming decades, atmospheric rivers that are double, triple what we just saw. And that's, that's terrifying to think about. Armel Castellan. And for more information on the situation in British Columbia, search for Twitter, hashtag BCStorm. This year, the UK has enjoyed an exceptionally mild autumn, but that's all set to change as winds begin to switch to the north. It's part of a bigger shift in conditions higher in the atmosphere. To find out more, I spoke to Met Office Deputy Chief Forecaster, Nick Silkstone. Nick, we're talking about trends into the middle part of next week, but in fact you can trace what's likely to happen across the UK back in time and in distance. It reaches back to the almost the northern part of the Indian Ocean and the Himalayas in the middle part of this week just gone. Just some enhanced thunderstorm activity across that, that area is actually pushing out warm air northwards. And that's actually just diverting the jet stream around to the north of the Himalayas and causing it to dig south across parts of southern China. That brings some very cold air down to basically the South China Sea and Northwest Pacific, where the sea surface temperatures are still of the order of 29 degrees. And where you get a strong contrast in temperatures, uh, that's where you get the strongest jet streams in the world. And this event will basically generate something called a, a Rosby wave energy packet, or you can just think of it as an energetic jet stream that will then start to propagate Okay, so let's talk about Rosby waves, first of all. I like to sort of imagine them, if you're looking at the North Pole and looking downwards, it almost, the Rosby waves almost look like it's a crown around the head of the world. They've actually got quite simple origins, but it's quite hard to visualise um, because the Earth's rotating around its North Pole. There's something called the Coriolis parameter increases from zero at the equator to its maximum value at the North Pole. And Rosby waves are basically that change in the Coriolis parameter, which increases as it comes north. And you end up with these big meandering patterns. Um, there can be various numbers of them across the world. And these Rosby waves actually have an influence over our weather locally. The energy in our jet stream, which is generated across the northwest Pacific, basically causes an amplification of these Rosby waves. So they increase in their amplitude and that gets bigger the further east you get. So we'll end up with a large ridge across the western part of North America, which will draw basically Arctic air southwards into parts of the eastern or central and eastern United States and Canada. And then that sets up a very strong east-west temperature gradient along with cold air along the eastern coast of the US. So that cold east-west gradient generates a, a southerly jet stream, which propagates up into Greenland. And that results in a huge ridge, which actually results in a breaking wave. So the, the ridge itself will break, overturn, and create an area of high pressure somewhere across the central Atlantic to the west of the UK. And that will eventually lead to uh, being drawn down from higher latitudes. And I think it's just worth saying we're, we are relatively confident that we're going to have a colder than average spell and certainly much colder than what we've been used to in late November. But to get snow at this time of year, you know, down to sea level, we need really cold air to come almost directly and quickly to the UK from the Arctic. Any sort of time it's spent over the seas of the North Atlantic and the Norwegian Sea, which are warmer than average, and it's still only the late autumn, so they're still relatively warm, will mean that that air is modified so although we're confident we're going to have a colder than normal spell with this air reaching us, it has to come pretty direct, you know, to bring a risk of snowfall all the way down to sea level. Nick Silkstone. Well, with a detailed look at the weather for the next few days, here's Aidan McGiven. A significant change in the weather is expected this weekend. We're going to transition from cloudy and mild to brighter but colder weather as the winds change from westerlies to northerlies. However, we start off with that mild and cloudy weather first thing Saturday. For most, it's a dry start, but for northern Scotland, some heavy rain at times on Saturday morning. And that pushes south into the rest of Scotland, as well as Northern Ireland, by lunchtime. 
by the afternoon. The outbreaks of rain are across northern England and north Wales, but that's a weakening feature, so the rain by this stage mostly light and on and off. To the south of that, we keep the cloudy and mild weather with some cloud breaks and temperatures well above average for the time of year. But for Scotland and Northern Ireland, in the wake of that weather front, we're going to see the skies brighten with a few showers following, but it will feel colder. And that colder air sinks south behind the weather front, clearing early Sunday from the south of the UK. And that means Sunday on the whole is a much colder day, but there will be some brighter skies as well, some decent sunny spells. There'll be some showers coming in on the brisk northerly wind. Those showers most likely to affect northern and eastern Scotland, eastern England. And there'll also be a few for southern and southwestern parts of England, as well as Wales. Now, with temperatures returning to around average for the time of year on Sunday, those showers will be on the wintry side over the hills and mountains of Scotland and the Pennines, but nothing unusual about that. For the start of next week, then, we begin with that cold air in place. A bright start, though, on Monday before things turn cloudy from the north, and that cloud introduces milder air for a time Tuesday and Wednesday. But later next week, there are increasing signs that the weather will turn even colder as northerly winds return. Thanks, Aidan. Since its release in 2009, the online game Minecraft has taken the gaming world by storm. The platform allows players to collaborate in building virtual landscapes and communities. Minecraft Education is an educational resource that allows students to learn more about subjects such as chemistry and geography. Now, in partnership with the Met Office, a new edition has been released exploring the impacts of climate change. To find out more, I spoke to Felicity Liggins, Scientific Manager of Education Outreach here at the Met Office. Imagine new climate futures with Minecraft Education Edition. These lessons were developed in partnership with Met Office, the UK's National Meteorological Service. We know that young people around the world today are already being affected by climate change and they will continue to be affected over the coming years. At the same time, we know that many teachers lack confidence in teaching about climate change in the classroom. So we're always looking for new ways to reach young people, their teachers and their families. So when we were approached by Microsoft, asking if we would contribute to their new climate change education resources that they were developing for Minecraft, we absolutely jumped at the chance. And this is despite me knowing virtually nothing about Minecraft other than it's just about blocks. <sighs> Well, I know you know a lot about education because I've seen you in the classroom and you're really impressive. Uh, so what is this latest resource? Tell me a bit more about it. We've contributed to the development of two new worlds under the banner of Climate Futures. So Climate Futures is essentially a series of lessons and immersive Minecraft worlds that explore climate change. The two worlds released so far tackle the subjects of agriculture and deforestation. Help students understand biodiversity, healthy soils, and local farms for sustainable food production. The important thing for this particular type of Minecraft world is that it sits on the education platform, which means that each world is supported by lesson plans written by professional educators, and these are linked to the sustainable development goals. So we're giving those real world links out to the wider kind of policy and action that's going on in the wider world. It's so layered, the approach, that even though it's a game, they're learning at the same time. What do you hope to achieve with the users? We want young people to feel more confident when they're thinking about climate change, to know some of the basics of the science. We know that there's a lot of misconceptions out there around what some of the jargon is. We want young people to kind of understand some of the basics, but not just stop there, to really think about what they can do, what their families could do, their school, their community, to help adapt to the impacts of climate change that we're seeing today and also to adapt to those changes we will continue to see through the 21st century and also some things around mitigation as well so how can we reduce the amount of greenhouse gases going into our atmosphere and how the different choices that we make as individuals have an impact on our wider world. So the information which is in there is from Met Office data. So who was involved from the Met Office? What data helped create these future scenarios? So there are teams all across the Met Office who are involved in groundbreaking science. So the scenarios that we 
incorporated into these worlds was really bringing that expertise to life in that block form. So, for example, in the Met Office, we do have experts working on the role of deforestation in places like Brazil. And the science that's been done there, we could translate that into kind of young person friendly language. So they know, their teachers know, and their parents or their guardians know that they're getting sort of authoritative information from a a world leading organisation. It is a unique area of collaboration, really, isn't it? And that's the beauty of it. It's, It's an exciting project to be involved in on that level. It is. And it just shows the power of partnerships. You know, there's no way that we could reach the numbers of young people around the world that are being reached through this partnership just on our own. So is it live now? Can we log on and dip into these future worlds? Yes. So if you just search online for Minecraft Climate Futures, then you'll be able to find the links directly to the Minecraft education pages where you can explore the worlds of the forest and the worlds of the farm, work your way through the lesson plans and have some fun as well as learning along the way. Inspire change in your classroom and beyond. Now, before we go, it's Martin Bowles with last week's highs and lows. Here are the extremes for last week, recorded between Monday the 8th of November and Sunday the 14th of November. Many areas had temperatures well above average for the time of year. The highest value was 17.3 Celsius on Tuesday at Harden in Clwyd in North Wales. That's about 7 degrees higher than it would be on a typical November day. The lowest temperature was minus 1.6 degrees Celsius at Braemar in Aberdeenshire early on Sunday. The largest daily rainfall amount was 40.2 mm at Tindrum in Perthshire on Friday. The sunniest place was Morecambe in Lancashire on Saturday. 8.0 hours were recorded. That doesn't seem like a lot, but it's only 39 minutes less than the total time between sunrise and sunset on that day. Thanks, Martin. That's it for Weathersnap. I'm Claire Nazir and the editor is Adrian Holloway. Weathersnap is a podcast by the UK Met Office.